So this morning, uh, we're going to take the text nice and slow, and if you look in your bulletin there, it says Psalm 119, verses 1 through 50. So I cut 26 verses out of it to, to ease it up a little bit. Um, I'm just kidding. So here's what happened when I was gone the first week, I got a, the, the bulletin went out and it said Psalm 119, and so Randy Babbitt, and then the next week... The bulletin said Psalm 119, and so I told Troy, I'm going to put Psalm 119 down for the third week, and then you guys can vote on who does it the best. Um, but then I found out Randy changed his and didn't do Psalm 119, and then there goes the whole joke. So um, we're actually today not going to be in Psalm 119, so we're going to uh, be working through Psalm 42 and 43. Psalm 42 and 43. And now Psalm 42 and 43, they are the first two psalms of book two of the psalms. Remember we talked about the very, going back to the first week in Psalm 1, how the book of Psalms has five units to it, right? Five units. So we, we Psalm 1 and 2 kind of introduced Psalm 1, uh, the first book, as well as kind of how to read the psalms. Now this gives us an introduction to Psalm 2, right? So, uh, or the book 2, Psalm 42 and 43. And most commentators actually agree that Psalm 42 and 43 were at one point, one psalm. They were not actually broken up into two different psalms. They were one single composition, much like Psalm 1 and 2 may have been, uh, which is a lot of par- parallels between how these two psalms on each side open up each book. Now, these psalms are by the sons of Korah, Psalm 42 and 43, which is uh, kind of fascinating on a historic level. If, if you remember who Korah was, he was the Levite, who gathered 250 chief leaders, tribal leaders from amongst the tribes of Israel and tried to make do have a rebellion against Moses and Aaron while they were wandering in the wilderness. So, so Korah is a pretty a bad guy in the Bible. And in judgment, God opens up the ground under Korah and his household and swallows them up and closes it back over them. And then the 250 tribal chiefs who had kind of scattered, he chases them down with fire and burns them up. However, all is not lost. We find out in Numbers 26, 11, that the sons of Korah did not die, right? So you have this, this is very interesting. You have this scenario where the father leads rebellion against God's elect, right? So Moses and Aaron, his chosen people to lead, but the sons of Korah have nothing to do with it. Like they're not on board with this rebellion. Uh, One commentator said this. He said, the fact, this fact reminds us that ungodly parents can produce godly children, and that no child is disqualified from serving God because of the sins of his parents. And that's a neat thing to pull. If you begin to pull that back in the New Testament, that's one of the things Jesus struggled with. Remember, what, did this, what sin did this blind guy do? What did his parents do? Why is he born like this? And so you can look back at Korah and see that's not how this works. So the following psalm is a composition by the sons of Korah. At some point, probably long after the rebellion of Korah, suggesting a long and fruitful lineage of faithfulness to God despite coming from someone who tried to rebel against God. So there's some gospel truth in that backstory, my friends. So with that kind of miniature sermonette, let's pray and we'll get into our text this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray that you give us wisdom and you give us discernment as we study your word today. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So our text this morning, Psalm 42 and 43, and we're just going to read them together. We're just going to run through both of them. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before him? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go to the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him and praise him my salvation. O oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and all your waves have gone over me. 
By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemies? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people and the deceitful and unjust man. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God. To God, my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with a lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my God and my salvation. Church, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. So Psalm 42 and 43 are what we call Psalms of Lament, right there. And we we have to be careful here because we're going to kind of make an argument throughout this sermon that lament is not the same thing as despair. These are very different things. And you remember Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are kind of of lens through how to read the Psalms. Yahweh and his anointed priest king, they scoff at the kings and the nations who rebel against them. That's kind of your your context for how to understand everything that happens after them. And so a lament differs from despair in that it always has in mind the final victory of the Lord. So lament has final victory of the Lord in mind, whereas despair ultimately just has hopelessness, right? Despair is ultimately hopeless. So we we see it's a lament, but uh, what's kind of the historical context of this lament, in particular by the sons of Korok, Uh, commentators kind of are split on this. Uh, A lot of people just go, we don't know. We don't know. And that's fair. There's a lot of places we just don't know the the reason it was written. Um, A a lot of people make a very strong argument that it's a lament written during the rebellion of Absalom when David is forced to flee Jerusalem. So one of the sons of Korah wrote this while they were running from Absalom into the hills. Uh, And the third case, which is the one I tend to hold on to the best, I think it makes the best case in context, Uh, It's about the exile of Judah, right? So as the captives are being carried off to Babylon, being carried off into captivity, this is what the sons of Korah have written, all right? I think that the strongest case can be made for that. Um, So I tend to hold that opinion. Uh, And the mention of Mount uh, Mazar in the fifth verse would have been kind of the last possible place as you were headed toward Babylon, the route that have taken that you could have been at the top of this mountain and, and looked back and seen Jerusalem, kind of been the last place you would have seen Jerusalem before you tipped over the hills for good and Jerusalem was gone. So as the captives are being taken to Babylon, this is the sight they're seeing as this lament is being written. However, which, regardless of which of those three views you take, uh, the thrust of the psalm doesn't change, right? The, the focus of the psalm is the same. Historical context just helps me. So the two psalms can be broken up into kind of these three major divisions. So verses 42, 1 through 5, we kind of have this yearning for God's presence, right? 1 through 5 is a yearning for God's presence. Uh, 6 through 11 is lamenting of God's perceived absence, right? This l- lamenting that God seems to be absent from his life. And then 43, 1 through 5, which is all 43, is calling to God. For salvation. So we have a yearning for God's presence, lamenting his perceived absence, and a calling to God for salvation. So let's begin with the first part, yearning for God's presence, starting in 42, 1 through 2. Read uh, 1 and 2 with me again. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul longs, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So, so the summer heat that we've had over the past month, past few weeks, has actually been record-shattering on a global perspective. Uh, from as far back as we've been kind of tracking these kinds of things, June 
of 2023 has been recorded as the warmest month globally. And we didn't have electricity for eight days of it. In particular, we had two days that really shattered records in June. And while you guys were here with that, I was putting beanies on my kids in Yellowstone. So just take that with you. It was wonderful. But I would bet that at some point, all of us, over the past month, past few weeks, we've all been familiar with this desire for water. Right? Like we've all had this, this time when the summer heat sits and then the, the wind doesn't move at all. It's stagnant. And all you can think about is getting that nice, refreshing glass of water. And the sons of Korah, they're writing that in the same way, in that same kind of oppressive heat, this is how their soul feels. This is the same way their soul desires God. Their souls thirst for God, thirst for the living God. When shall their dry, parched souls drink deeply of the well that their soul so much desires? And friends, we've, I think we've all been there. And I think that's what makes the psalm so powerful is the author's able to say aloud something in such a way that we often would hesitate to say it aloud ourselves. You can't be an elder of a church and sit in front of everyone and tell them that your soul is dry. You can't be a pastor and do that. You can't be a deacon, right? You can't do those things. You can't look at your kids and say, my soul's dry. But it's true. It happens to all of us. And so the psalmist, the sons of Korah, they're, they're admitting to this reality of human nature, this reality of sinfulness. They desire the presence of God. They're chasing it down like a deer in the desert, trying to find water, running, 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 and feeling like every moment their energy is depleting. And I think we all know the feeling. And Psalm 42.3 says it really well. Look, he says, my tears have been my food day and night. I've never had my tears for food. I don't know if you guys had. That sounds pretty bottom of the barrel there. My tears have been my food day and night. And they say to me all day long, where's your God? And what happens is when God kind of feels distant and he feels out, there can be this, this bitterness, this grief that we tend to live with. And so this, it becomes a taunt. Where is your God? And in verse 4, he says this. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. So these are the things he's remembering as he's crying out to God, as he's yearning for God, how I would go with the throng, right, and lead them into the procession of the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise. See, when our soul is dry, we yearn. We have these memories of these things that we would do, and we yearn for them, right? These memories of being in this church, feeling like you're talking to God and he's sitting right next to you. Right, having the, that intimacy. There's the, the worst with other believers we take for granted so much. Maybe sometimes we sit here and we, we allow, uh, C.S. Lewis is one of the, the best at saying this in the screw tape letters the, the men work through in the, in the, the spring. He says that, you know, the point is when, for the, the demon who's tempting the guy, when he goes to church, let him focus on the people who annoy him more than anything else, right? Like, like, let him focus on the person who sings off key, the ladies whose perfume is too strong, like the guy who slighted him one time. Let that be the concern. Detract from the presence of God. And so we can remember when we're yearning what it was like to, to feel on the mountaintop, to feel so close to God, and you remember and you crave those things. It may even be, be thinking in your head, remember uh, the, the Sunday of sweat in here um, a few weeks ago, we did Psalm 24, and you can see the contrast of joy. Here he's yearning, but look what they would sing as they would approach the presence. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers, the highs and the lows. The highs and the lows of spiritual Dryness and spiritual nurturing. 
And so the sons of Korah, as they're being taken off into captivity, they're longing to be in the presence of the Lord. And for them, that presence is the house of the Lord, the temple. But they can no longer go there. They miss the presence of God. Their soul longs for it. They lament the gathering of the saints, the celebrations, the worship, and the fellowship. All of that is gone. Their souls are dry without Yahweh's living water. But remember, Lament is different than despair. Look at the refrain in verse 5. We're going to see how, this is how we close out each section. You're going to see this three times. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation. So what's the answer for the despairing soul? What's the answer for the soul that feels that is dry that it feels like it's panting after God, that misses the fellowship, that can't seem to get anything right. It's to hope in God. That's the difference. There's the lament. What makes us a lament? Hope in God. He is our salvation. We have to be able to define hope, right? Hope, uh, we use hope flippantly, right, in most things. We don't use hope the way that hope is used in the Bible. Uh, it's, It's not some fanciful idea, right? Like, I hope that Dak Prescott those less interceptions this year. I do hope that, but not in the same way that I hope uh, Christ really did die on the cross my sins, that I believe those things, right? There's a difference in how we use hope. I hope it doesn't rain. I hope I win the lottery. No, hope is this confident expectation, right? So hope is this confident assurance in something. And in this case, for these sons of Korah, what's the hope? It's a return to the presence of God. It's a confident expectation that they will return to the presence of God someday. And this is not the answer that the world wants you to hear. When your soul is cast down and when you're in turmoil within, human wisdom wants to tell you to move on and find another solution because that one doesn't work. And when you're being carried away by pagans into exile and you've witnessed your, the sons of your king all be executed, you witnessed his eyes then gouged out, so that was the last thing he saw, and you're being carried off, guess what? Yahweh may not seem like the best option right now. The world tells us, look elsewhere when those things begin to fall apart in your mind. But again, that's the difference in lament and despair. See, someone who despairs starts scrambling. What else could possibly save? Where else could I go? Who else could I find? Where else could I turn? The lament says, but we still have our hope in God. In a lament, the foundation of the emotion is hope. You can pour out all of the grief, all of the burdens, all the issues, but what underlines all of it is hope. And this may be a, 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 a bold statement um, here, but I'm going to make it. I don't believe non-Christians can lament. There's no Christ. Without Christ, there's no hope. You can't lament if you can't have hope. All they can do is despair. I hope that doesn't come up at Presbytery sometime. No one else said that. I just, this is the way I've kind of put it together. Only someone in Christ can truly, deeply lament. Everyone else is stuck with nothing but despair. And so when your soul feels dry, when your Christian walk feels dead, the answer is to hope in your God. The answer to a soul that yearns for God's presence is not seeking other sources of comfort, That's kind of like grabbing a soda or a beer from the fridge after hours of working in the desert heat, right? It it may taste good. It may feel like it satisfies, but we know that it's a false, empty satisfaction. It doesn't truly nurture, truly give you what you need. We seek the living waters of Yahweh. We hope in our God. So, so we've seen the, the yearning for God's presence in these first five verses, right? And they, they're laid out so beautifully with so much depth to them, uh, and this lament, and it has this hope at the end. So let's move to our middle section, our second main point, um, verses 6 through 11. It's lamenting, the, lament, the, lamenting of, excuse me, the lamenting of God's perceived absence. 
It's going to pick up kind of awkwardly here in your Bibles and on the screen. I'm going to explain that in a minute. And my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and of, Mount, uh, and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roars of your waterfalls. All your breakers and all your waves have gone over me. So first, we got to talk about this weird uh, kind of versification thing here happening in 6. So every, every translation is an interpretation, right? So that's why we have English translations that are all a little bit different, um, even like modern ones, not like different ages, because because someone's interpreting the Hebrew to how they think it kind of fits. So every interpretation, translation is an interpretation, and the ESV and many others take verse 6, the very beginning, and they kind of tag it into verse 5, right? Uh, kind of in a weird way, and I'm going to show you how my, my ESV does it. It does it like this. So you see 5 up there. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And then it breaks. And it comes down into my soul is cast down within me. But it's interesting, in the Hebrew, there's no and. So the and my God, the and is not there. Okay? It's just simply my God. And that means that God is what we call the evocative case, which just means that it's, it's signifying who we're talking to. That's all it means. It's just, it's just pointing to who we're talking to. Uh, so it's better to read this like this. The Hebrew breaks it down like this. So Psalm 42 Starting in five, we'll kind of put them together here. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. And then there's a break. And then it says, O O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and from Hermon, from Mount Mazar. So the, the original Hebrew seems to show this section as being more of a prayer, being more of a prayer, right? So he's, he's expressed his yearning. He's expressed his, his desire for God. And then the next section is really a prayer. So, oh my God, Lord, my soul is cast down within me. Right? It's, it's an appeal to the Father. It's out of his yearning for God's presence that he cries out to a God who seems so distant. And it continues in verse 7, deep, Calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Deep calls to deep. In other words, it's kind of a poetic way to say that from the heights of the, from Mount Mazar to the depths of the ocean, or from the heavens to the abyss, or from one extreme of creation all the way down to the lowest extreme of creation. In some way, they're communicating. They're talking to each other. They're calling out to each other. And and the Targum, which is a a first century interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, uh, they explain it the phrase like this. He says, the abyss above calls to the abyss below in the voice of the deluge of Yahweh's water spouts. In other words, the sons of Korah are describing the feeling as if they are trapped between these massive stormy outpourings of waterfalls, the outpouring of God's wrath, anger, and storms all the way from the heavens, all the way down to the depths, and this pouring over them. Remember, we've talked about the sea, how it represents judgment, about how Jonah going down represents death, Sheol, all all those things. The the sons of Korah are saying, "We're we're stuck in this. Like, we're stuck in what's being poured out from above and sweeping us down into the abyss. I think sometimes like our, our anguish and our, our distance from God can really feel like this. Hopelessness, feeling lost. And then watch the change. This is, it's, it's amazing what he does in verse 8 here. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. And there's a reality here, something that really just jumped out to me was sometimes the intellectual knowledge of God has a tough time reaching here. Right? Like we, we can intellectually know that God commands his steadfast love, right? The sons of Korah know that God hasn't forsaken them. Why are you cast down on my soul? I will hope in God. They know their God is there, but they're just expressing their soul. They're having trouble taking it from here to here. And verse 8 is this statement of intellectual knowledge that the sons of Korah, they know it to be true. 
They know God to be sufficient. They know God to be on their side, but they're just expressing how they feel. It feels pretty bad right now. And that's what I think makes the lament so unique and so powerful, right? You can say all these terrible things that I feel like if you said out loud, people would go, wow, that guy needs to step away. Like you say all that stuff, but then they have this point where they say, but we hope in our God. Like he's in control. He's steadfast. He's the one who has all this figured out. And it just makes the lament so, so such a rich thing to study in the Psalms. It's a means of pouring out sufferings and groanings before God and sharing how our heart feels at the same time keeping the perspective right. And you could probably think of this in a much smaller way if you consider uh, like fights you've had with your spouse uh, or your children or your parents. There's those moments when you are absolutely furious. Right? There's moments when you are so angry at them about something, deeply hurt, you're in pain, you feel disconnected, and a simple I love you in the midst of all that turmoil, it might not immediately solve what's happening here, but it sure does help here. And church, when you find yourselves on the brink of despair, and there's nothing better that you can do than remind yourself of the promises of God. This is a, a recurring theme to the scriptures, is to lean on the promises of God. Okay, let's keep going. Even though the psalmist has made a point of confidence in the Lord. He's going to return, right? He's going to, he's going to, it's kind of like, can I imagine, like I watched my daughter swim yesterday. It's kind of like she goes under and it's just chaos, right? Like she's trying to learn and there's splashing everywhere. You're covering drinks and, and she just pops up for that big breath of air and everything stabilizes for a second and she goes right back into it. It's kind of what the, it's kind of what the psalmist is doing. He's, he's giving you all the disruption, all the stuff that's happening. He's going to, he pops up, but God is steadfast. And we love him. He's going to go right back down into it, okay? So here we go, 9 through 10. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemies? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? And sometimes in the midst of our suffering, those may ask us, where is your God, right? Uh, this is the question Job was asked. It's the question, one of the great questions that uh, psychology tries to figure out. And um, why do good, bad things happen to good people? Where is your God? In this case, in case the psalmist here, these guys are being carried off into captivity. And they're, they're probably some of the few faithful remaining Israelites in Judah. Where is your God? Where's your God, the Babylonians ask. Where's your God, the Egyptians ask. Where's your God, the Canaanites ask. And it can lead us to ask the same, where's God now? When cancer strikes, when relationships begin to tear apart, when pain and sickness appear, it's easy to ask, where's your God? Where's our God? And he gives us the answer in the next verse. And again, people are popping back up for air here. You ready? Why are you cast down, oh, my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. God is there. Hope in him. Uh, Samuel Smiley's long dead Puritan guy said it like this. Hope is like the sun, which as we journey towards it, casts the shadow of our burdens behind us. That's good. I like that. Hope, as you hope and you point to Christ, eventually those burdens will fall away. So as we move to what's now labeled Psalm 43, our final section, we've seen first the yearning for God's presence in, in 42, 1 through 5. We've seen second the lamenting in, of God's perceived absence, right, in 42, 6 through 11. Now we're going to see the final section, 43, 1 through 5, which is the psalmist calling to God for salvation. Look with me at verses uh, 1 and 2. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? From despair comes this call for vindication, right? In other words, it's God. They taunt me and they ask me, where are you? Reveal yourself. Save me from the ungodly people. Right? Come down. Make your presence known. But note the assurance of the psalmist in the statements. Look at verse 2. 
for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Right? So despite the ungodly people, the deceitful ones, the unjust man deliver me, God in you I take refuge. Right? There's no one else. There is nothing else. The only possible option for refuge is Yahweh, is this God. But his soul still feels rejected. Again, there's that intellectual knowledge and that heart knowledge, right? We, we know, but sometimes it's hard to convince. We've all been here once again. And some of you may be in that place like right now, right? Yearning for the joy of the Lord, which feels so lost. And if so, listen to the following prayer. If that's you, listen to this prayer closely in verses three and four. This is what the sons of Korah say. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. How do the sons of Korah ask God to lead them? Has he, in this despair and all these issues or the, the lamenting, what do they say? Send us your light and truth. Send us your light and truth. Friends, for that, that's the word of God. For us, that's the scriptures, right? It is God's light and truth that brings us into his presence, that brings us into his joy, into his word, right? So it's the scriptures. So if you're, if you're a heart that is despairing, if you're a soul that feels dry, what, what, what Satan wants to do is get you to leave those things alone. And what the, what the sons of Korah say, we need the light and we need the truth of God. Like, that's what takes us out of this place. And, and there's a pretty difficult, uh, maybe an often difficult to embrace uh, reality about Christian fellowship and biblical study here. And I just want to talk about this for a second. When you find yourself wanting to avoid the body of Christ, I believe that's when you need it the most. When you're in a season of lament, you need the fellowship of the body of Christ. When you're in a season of lament, you need to be surrounded by people who have the same hope that you have. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we're not deceived into thinking that we can nurture our soul as needed on our own, right? That we could build our walk away from the body of Christ. Christians are meant for the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is meant for Christians. The sons of Korah long. They yearned for an opportunity to gather with the saints in the presence of God. Remember, he said, I would lead them into the temple. I'm going to lead them into the tabernacle. This was their job. They were leaders of worship. That's what nurtured their soul, the presence of God with the people of God. And, and Steve and I were talking about this on, I guess, Thursday, and he had a great illustration I'm going to steal. It's, it's like removing a log from a roaring fire, right, and setting it off to the side. It may burn for a while. It's going to add some heat for a while, but eventually the embers will fade. They will start smoking more and more, and the heat will dissipate. All of those private things we do in our study, um, in our prayer life, they are all wonderful, and they are necessary additions, but they are not replacements for the people of God worshiping together. Paul himself tells us, don't forsake the gathering of the saints. The light and truth of God will lead you to the people of God, which in the Old Testament, the context of this psalm and, and God's presence is the temple. It's the assembly. So as an active member, I kind of believe only as an active member of the body of Christ, will you find exceeding joy, praise, and the nourishment of the Father. The Christian walk is not meant to be a solo walk. And when the psalmist, when these sons of Korah desire to be led once again into God's presence with the whole congregation of God, they know that's where they will find joy. That's where the dry soul is nourished. And we're not left with despair by the sons of Korah. Instead, we're left with hope, which is the backbone of lament. Once again, we get this familiar refrain. We've seen it twice before. We're going to get it now again in verse 5. And I think it's a wonderful way to close out the sermon. Psalm 43, 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my God and my salvation. 